Today we are having a very special and a very short episode of Let Them Eat Bread, as we are not going to be on next week due to just me being out of town, and it figured it'd be nice to make something super quick uh, so I don't have to worry about, you know, having a bunch of bread in the house. So today for our short episode, we are making shortbread, specifically my favorite shortbread recipe, which is super simple and it's a ratio recipe. And what that means is you can multiply it to make it bigger or smaller. So the ratio is two of flour, one of butter, one half of sugar, okay? And you can make this in any combination you want. So today we have four cups of flour, we have two cups of butter, and we have one cup of sugar. And we're just gonna mix those together, pat them in here, I'll show you how it's all done, and then chuck it in the oven. When we put it in the oven, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about baking times and why you can do shortbreads at different baking times. But in the meanwhile, Let's get started. So we've combined our flour and our sugar here. And essentially, this is just to make sure that when we mix our butter in, it's going to be much easier for it. And we're not trying to mix the sugar in after the fact. So we're going to build ourselves a nice little wall here, just like we would for any other liquid or liquid type ingredient. And then we're going to pour in our butter. So you want this butter softened at room temperature, but you don't want it melted, okay? The oven is gonna do the melting for us. You don't want it melted in the bowl. And you wanna make sure to get all the butter out of that bowl because the butter is the primary agent that cooks this into shortbread. So that is why you need as much of it as you can get out of your bowl. Don't put extra in, but just make sure you've got enough. And now we combine. This is gonna look a lot like folding and it will take some time, so don't rush it. If your butter is in large clumps, you wanna use your mixing device to kind of cut it into little pieces so you can get as much flour and sugar incorporated as possible. You can also do this process entirely with your hands and shortly I will switch to my hands, but in the meanwhile, I'm just using, uh, just using a regular rubber spatula here to get this uh, partly combined. So as well as folding the mixture, you wanna make sure that you're pressing down, pressing the flour and, and sugar into the butter uh, to combine it. I'm also using a chopping motion to break the butter down into smaller pieces. All right, so you could do all this in, in, a, in a, um, a mixer or um, a food processor, but I like doing it this way. And then I'm just gonna to switch to my hands here and keep your spatula around because we're gonna use it to flatten it. So at this point, your dough will look a little bit like pie crust. It'll be nice and flaky, but we don't want it like this. We actually want it to all kind of come together to one. So we're gonna use our hands and make it into one buttery, sugary, floury mass. And if it feels a little buttery, that's okay. Don't add any more dry ingredients to it. Most of the butter will end up um, becoming less salient as we cook it. So just make sure it's kind of in one mass for the most part. All right, now, I'm just gonna pick up some of it so you can see. It's gonna look very much yellower, like because of the butter. And also there's gonna be there's gonna be no amount of flour that doesn't have any butter in it or sugar that doesn't have any butter in it. So you could technically bring it onto one piece if you want to, but we don't need to do that. What we're gonna do is we're gonna take our dough and put it into a 13 by nine baking tray that has been greased and lined. Okay, I would pick it up and show you, but my hands are a little covered. But essentially you wanna line it with parchment paper. You don't wanna use tin foil. Parchment paper is gonna make it much easier. And when you're doing your greasing of the tray, you wanna grease the metal of the tray, put the parchment paper on top of it. And then after that, you also wanna grease the parchment paper. That'll help with getting it out. So we're gonna transfer this over a little bit at a time. It doesn't need to be one block when you transfer it. And the reason for that is because we are going to make it the right shape and size once it's in the dish. Okay. Just get the last of this in here. Perfect. Now any that's sticking to your hands or whatever, just, you know, Get that off. Remember, it bakes, so you don't have to worry about it. Also, you know, we, we wash our hands before we start baking here, so you don't have to worry 
as much about that. So, so give it a, a quick press down to flatten it out. Get the excess dough off your hands. Then wash your hands and come back. And we're going to flatten it out. So now we're going to take the bottom of a metal cup measure and or your spatula. And we're just going to press this flat. So you can see it's in a bunch of clumps right now. And we're just going to press it flat to the ends of the container. And it doesn't really matter how thick it is as long as it's thick, consistently thick across the board. So where it sticks, you're just going to use your spatula here to get that off and then keep pressing it in. And at some point, you're going to just need to use your hands, just flatten it out. Honestly, you can use whatever method you think works best. Just get it to an, uh, an even consistency. Use a fist, use an open hand, use a tool if you want to. Beautiful thing about shortbread is there's very little about it that's truly exact. So don't fret about making it perfectly flat either. You will not hurt the shortbread or your enjoyment of it if it's not flat. All right, so you can see this is mostly flat. You can see my hand prints in it, but that's really not a big deal, okay? So if you want to flatten it out further, just take a flat surface to it. Um, just make sure that you've got some way so that it doesn't stick because you've just done a lot of work to get it flat. You don't want it to be worse now. You don't want it to be worse after you were trying to flatten it, right? Once you do that, we're going to chuck it in a 350-degree Fahrenheit oven. And this is going to be a variable time. So, and the reason for that is a bunch of reasons. One, it doesn't always cook the same way each time. But more importantly, everyone likes their shortbread with a little bit of a different level of bite. Personally, I like a softer shortbread. So I put my shortbread in for like 20, 25 minutes. This will probably need a little bit more because I've made a little bit of a bigger shortbread today. But really, you just want to make sure that it's done to your likeness, okay? So if you want it to be like a really dark golden brown color and have a nice crispy shortbread, then great, leave it in for longer, talking 35 to 45 minutes. If you're like me and you like a softer shortbread, maybe 20 to 30 minutes is gonna be okay. My best advice for this, especially because you're cooking it at a relatively low temperature of 350 degrees, is you're gonna wanna put it in, leave it for 20 minutes, and then every 10 minutes after that, just check on it and see if it's done. I'm gonna be leaving mine in until I have a golden brown crust and nice pale in the middle. Okay, that'll give me a nice little bit of a crusty, a nice little bit of a crunch on the outside, but nice and soft and luscious um, and very flaky on the inside. Okay, and that's personally how I like mine. You don't have to have it that way, of course, you can do it any way you like, but that's what we're gonna do. So I'm going to put this in the oven right now and set my timer for 20 minutes. Meanwhile, we are going to talk some politics. I've got a couple of stories I want to talk to you guys about this week. But just like I said, we'll put in for 20 minutes and then we'll check it every 10 minutes afterwards until it's done. And we'll just keep doing stories until it's where I want it to be. All right, guys, be right back. All right, so we've got about 20 minutes on our clock here. We are going to talk some stories between now and then. And then, as I mentioned, we're just going to make sure that we're checking it to make sure it's where we want it. So at home, Make sure that you set a time for about 20 minutes, whether you're staying with me or not. Make sure to check yours and just add 10 minutes to it uh, and get it to the color you like. There's almost no way to really go wrong with it, and it takes a long time to burn. So don't worry about that. You'll have perfect shortbread in no time, all right? So first, let's get into our story that I'm not going to cut up, and that is on the Russia-Ukraine is another Russia-Ukraine war story. So one of the things that's been interesting about watching what's been going on with the Russia-Ukraine war is the amount that it has been used to cover up political repression. And although we see some of it, there's a lot of it that we're not seeing that is you know, really disturbing when you think about the, the consequences and just kind of what it means in general. So the instances I'm talking about now, I'll give all the instances I'm talking about first, and then I can talk about why I think they're problematic. So in Ukraine, there is essentially military rule in place right now, which makes sense. It's kind of a crisis. But uh, yesterday, Zelensky essentially fired two generals claiming that they were traitors to Ukraine, didn't offer any evidence to that, just kind of got rid of them 
And I don't know what else is in their future, but when a country calls you a traitor, usually you're in trouble, right? There's, there's, you know, being fired from your job isn't really the end of it. You know, in the U.S., treason is is a death sentence, literally. So, you know, it's really dangerous for a, a leader in wartime to call generals traitors without offering any evidence, without putting anything else forward. The other thing Zelensky did without any evidence was claim that 11 political parties were tied to Russia, and then he banned them all. Now, the banning of political parties should be an absolute last resort. The desire for political representation to come from all different sides. Remember, lots of Ukrainians speak Russian, right? So there, there could be some connection there. But Zelensky did not offer any evidence for this. He declared that 11 national political parties were um, essentially puppets of Russia, were, you know, had Russian ties and just banned all of them. Okay. Now in Russia, we've seen the Duma pass three laws um, each of which have varying levels of penalties, but around spreading fake news, which they essentially consider any type of discussion about the war. I'm um, sorry, this, the special military operation. You can't even call it a war, by the way. You can get jail time literally just for calling it a war, which is totally crazy. And these other, these other laws essentially make it illegal to protest the conflict. And it makes it illegal to talk about the conflict in a way that is not approved by the government. Okay. And this, and we're talking like between three and 15 years in prison for this. Okay. So there's a huge amount of political repression going on in Russia, as well as just general bans on protests. Now they have said that it's because of COVID, but you know, that just hasn't really held up. Uh, the COVID cases in Russia aren't such that these protests are having that significant of an influence on them. But also, and more importantly, you know, these rules literally just came about now, right? So it isn't, the COVID's been going on for two years, right? If it was really going to be a ban on protest because of COVID, they would have put it in place when COVID was kind of, you know, a much bigger deal than, than it is now in the West anyway. So obviously that's, that's bullshit. And then in the US, we're seeing a really interesting and different kind of political repression going on, which is essentially... There's, um, you know, the xenophobia against Russia in general in this country started in 2016, right, with um, the the so-called, you know, Russian collusion, Russian interference in the election, of which there were varying degrees of evidence, but not a ton, and certainly not enough to convince me and, and large swaths of the population that Russia actually changed the election in favor of Donald Trump. And I've actually talked on this show in the past about how Donald Trump was, uh, you know, balmy at best towards Russia, uh, but not super close and, and did things that the Russians weren't going to like, for example, um, you know, the, the, you know, acting against Russia's interests in Syria and, and things of that nature that just clearly show that, that Trump was either ambivalent to Russia or didn't really, you know, it you know, ambivalent at best, right? Ambivalent to Russia and, and otherwise outwardly hostile towards Russia. So anyway, doesn't really matter. But anyway, so the xenophobia in the US uh, concerning Russia started in 2016 and it's just gotten worse, right? So there have been um, the so-called Russia gate that has been perpetuated over and over and over and over again, which made, um, and then of course with the war, we saw all sorts of crazy things going on. First, the sanctions, which of course, you know, they make a lot of sense. We want to do something to help the Ukrainians, right? And, and hurting the oligarchs, great, perfect, love it, you know, gotta have it. But, you know, we started sanctioning things that hurt regular Russian people, like stopping them from using their Apple Pay or Google Pay in the transit systems, you know, forcing major companies to pull out of Russia and and those types of things. And, and by the way, hurting retail banks that help ordinary Russian people devaluing their currency, it, it makes it very difficult for the Russian people. And because they don't have any say really in what goes on in their country, punishing them is, it, it's overkill, it's it's superfluous, it, it doesn't help. If anything, it might actually make our cause less viable over there, right? Because they think that the West can't save them. And I've talked about that as well. And so as that's ramped up, and we've seen all sorts of things, right? The, the banning of, of Russian liquor being sold, um, 
some crazy nonsense in Canada where they renamed Putin because it sounds like Putin. And I, I mentioned how silly this is anyway, but you know, now what's happening is, is that anyone that was affiliated with the television channel Russia Today, which it, indeed was state funded, but a lot of times had criticism of Russia on it, uh, including Abby Martin, who was a virulent critic of the Russian invasion in Crimea and on Russia Today, right? So there are lots of examples of people on Russia Today, the or, or Russia Today America, being critical of the Russian government and not being censored. But now YouTube especially is essentially censoring anything that has anything remotely Russia oriented. So um, recently Chris Hedges, who did a, who did a whole bunch of work um, unveiling, uh, re revealing kind of the terrible war things that America has done, he got pulled down from YouTube um, huge amounts of content that was featured on Russia that was featured on Russia today has been um, cut out of YouTube. And those, a lot of those are historical records, interviews with people um, either that have passed or are no longer able to be interviewed for whatever reason. And so that level of pol political repression is done by private companies over here. But, you know, you don't see a major um, condemnation of this behavior by, you know, the so-called free speech warriors uh, on the right wing. And certainly in the Democratic Party, you don't either. You know, there seems to be a lot of just desserts ism going around with this. But truthfully, you know, there's a lot of American journalists who are suffering because of, you know, affiliations with with Russia or affiliation with Russia today and, and, and things of that nature, which are are totally ridiculous. So most of these come down to freedom of speech issues, right? So at what level do we want to grant people the ability to say what they want to say? And I'm obviously a little biased because I have lots of opinions and I share them with you on a fairly regular basis. So it's really important to me personally that, you know, there isn't this level of restriction and I can speak freely about Russia and Ukraine and what's going on over there and express the opinions um, of, of people of Russian descent and, and kind of express my opinions about, you know, what people's motivations are on both sides of the conflict and not feel like I could be censored for that. Now, mind you, this is a small channel, right? They're not, you know, they're not going into my little channel and seeing. Um, so I might be safe just because of how small my audience is. But, you know, you don't want to set that as a precedent, right? Because as soon as, as soon as we look the other way when it's happening to someone else, that gives that gives consent to the censors to continue doing censorship, right? So we obviously don't want that. And again, in the US, it's happening in mostly private company spaces. But in Russia and in Ukraine, it's happening very publicly, right? And we, as, Ru as Ukraine's ally, we want to encourage them to recognize the great rights that we you know, commend them for having most of the time, one of which is, is freedom of speech, freedom of assembly. And so the banning of political parties is especially problematic because it's the intersection of the two. Obviously, a political party is a right of association. It allows you to come together with like-minded individuals and run for office. But also, and, and perhaps more importantly, is the ability for you to, in that political party, speak out for or against your government without fear of reprisal from your government or opposition or whatever you essentially need to be able to, especially as a politician, speak against the interests of the state without being harassed by the state. And of course, let's not forget about what Russia is doing. Uh, certainly Ukraine, what Ukraine is doing in terms of free speech is certainly not as bad as what the Russians are doing. But, you know, the war is being used as an excuse for all of this level, all of these levels of political repression to take place. And there hasn't really been a wide scale reckoning that democracy, and by the way, free speech is a key portion of democracy. You can't have will the people if the people cannot express themselves. That democracy is regressing in Ukraine and Russia, and by the way, in the US too, but you know, that's a whole can of worms I just don't want to get into right now. But, you know, I think it's really important that we call out this level of political repression in Russia, in Ukraine, passively in the US, to get more people aware of it, and also to, to try and put a stop to it. Because at the end of the day, it's super important that if we want thriving democracies, that we allow people 
with whose viewpoints we disagree to still have conversations, right? If Zelensky could prove that the generals were actually traitors, like had real evidence, real hard, convincing evidence that the, you know, the generals that he, he fired were traitors or that the parties, you know, were actually like working for Russia on the inside and were, and were committing espionage and providing information to Russia, fine, then you can charge them under criminal statutes, which punish them for harming the state. But what it looks like now is that they're being punished for having a relationship with Russia or being backed by Russia. And just because they receive money from Russia or they have influence from Russia doesn't make them non-Ukrainian political parties, right? As I mentioned closer to the top of the segment, lots of people in Ukraine have very close ties with Russia. That doesn't make them traitors either. And you might find the occasional Ukrainian who are in favor of Russia's um, war there. But again, that doesn't make them traitors either. So as we go forward and we watch this unfold, we just have to be very careful about how we endorse Zelensky. And by the way, weeks ago, I talked about not making Zelensky into a hero. This is why. Because as soon as we made him into a hero, it becomes very easy to overlook things like this which are inherently anti-democratic and should be against the interests and desires of all Americans and all freedom-loving people worldwide. But as soon as we dub someone an infallible hero, or just a hero in general, and many of them we consider infallible by their very nature, we, we lose the ability to have these conversations in good faith. And so that's what concerns me a lot about this. So and obviously I condemn the, the, the free speech violations in Russia. People should not be going to prison for protesting. People should not be going to prison for telling the truth about what's going on in Ukraine, for talking about Putin's losses, for talking about, you know, what a quagmire this is, for talking about the war crimes being committed on both sides. You should not go to prison for that. You know, we need to protect these freedoms as much as possible with any influence we can. And because we have influence in Ukraine right now, you know, we need to put pressure on Zelensky somehow to, you know, to reverse course with these or to provide hard evidence that implicates these in crimes against the Ukrainian state. I get that it's wartime and decisions are going to be made in a rash way. But if we want Ukraine to go back to being a vibrant democracy after this, and by the way, their democracy wasn't so vibrant before, don't get me wrong, there were all sorts of issues. But if we want, at the end of this, Ukraine to be a vibrant democracy, allied with the West, kind of a Western style democracy, we cannot allow these arbitrary cancellations of rights just because there's a war on. It's it's totally unacceptable, and, and I condemn it from whoever it's coming from. That's good. Oh, damn. Okay. So before we get started with this segment, I want to say that I absolutely condemn all violence in all forms. I'm a peacenik. I do not approve of any form of violence. I think all war and violence is wrong. So to start this story, there was an attack in Israel last week, uh, a terror attack um, by a man who was identified as being Palestinian. Um, he shot and killed five Israeli Jews uh, before he was killed by police. This is an unspeakable horror, a terrible tragedy, and five people don't get to go back to their families at the end of the day. And I really wish that that wasn't the case. But if that was the end of the story, it would be easy just to see this as a blind act of terror that is uh, you know, unspeakable and unexplainable and, and tragic. And by the way, it is tragic. It is unspeakable. But when you look at the situation that the Palestinians have been put in, it sometimes make it, makes it more understandable why they may choose violence. I'm a firm believer that most people do not choose violence as their first way of, of fighting back. I believe that people are likely, if they feel that they are, if they feel that they are empowered to be peaceful in their resistance, that they will do that first. If for no other reason, then it is safer for them 
to appeal to their um, appeal to the powers that be by nonviolent means than by violent means. So from the very outset, I believe that people are inclined to use nonviolence resistance first to a situation to which they don't approve. As I've mentioned last week on the show, Israel is, is executing an apartheid against the Palestinian people and Israeli Arabs. And for many, many years, Palestinians have protested the things that Israel have done. They have picketed, they have, you know, held signs, they have tried to file lawsuits, they've tried to do things as much as possible in peaceful means. And, and I encourage all oppressed people to go through this process, to try as much as possible to change the wrongs in their life by peaceful means. However, after doing that for so long, some people will get frustrated with the lack of movement. And they will think that, well, if peace didn't work, if nonviolence didn't work, violence becomes the solution. And I never want to be in a situation where that looks like the best solution, because truthfully, it's not. There's no good reason that's coming along. There's no good reason why you should revert to violence. Because truthfully, violence is almost always counterproductive. Unless you can lead a revolution that is so large and so well-funded and so well-organized and so well-armed that you can actively displace your oppressors, violence is going to lead to further repression and more disadvantageous to the cause that you're fighting for when the state is reacting to violence the repression of the state then looks more justified. So you can actually be counterproductive in your doing of violence. And so truthfully, I don't think this terror attack in Israel is going to change anything in Israel for the Palestinians. In fact, I know it's not going to. It is going to make people who are most likely innocent lose the ability to live their lives which is terrible. But when we look at state violence, apartheid is state violence, by the way. When we look at state violence against a people and how long it's been going on, it is unfortunate yet not surprising that some people would, would in their desperation, in their frustration, turn to senseless, useless, violent, hateful acts. And so I want to say again that I feel just terrible for the five people who were killed. May their memories always be for a blessing. You know, may their families be okay. You know, I, I pray for them. And I also pray for the family of the Palestinian man who was killed in the terror attack. They're missing someone too. And this violence is only going to beget more violence. It's not going to make the situation any better for the Palestinians, and it's certainly not going to make it any better for the Jews. And I do believe that a peaceful solution is possible. And I never want to be in a position where I feel like I have to say that violence is the answer, because I just don't believe that for the most part. But you know, looking at it objectively, as objectively as I can, it becomes difficult to look at a situation like that and say that, that you know, this act of violence was random, that it, it had nothing to do with anything, that it was unprovoked, that it wasn't reactive in some way. And when you think about the reality of what's going on in Israel and Palestine, it becomes very easy to see why someone might revert to a senseless act like this. So as we continue as outsiders, and even if, if you're watching this and you're in Israel, you're in Palestine, you know, as insiders too, it, it looks difficult to get to a peaceful solution, to get to a settlement. 
And there are lots of factors working against that. I get that. I really do. But Israelis committing violence against Palestinians and Palestinians committing violence against Israelis doesn't actually get you any closer to that. It actually tears it farther away. For everyone killed in a terrorist attack, you set the process of peace back that much farther. And a process that is moving slow enough as it is. So, you know, this is really hard for me because I love the state of Israel and I want there to be peace there. And I believe that that Jews and Christians and Palestinians and Arabs and, and everyone who claims a different identity under that in that land can live together peacefully. I, I really do believe that, that there can be, you know, it doesn't have to be named Israel, it doesn't have to be named Palestine, you could call it something else. But that land is important to so many people. It can be a peaceful place. There are peaceful ways, democratic ways to commit to the governance of places with multiple cultures. Switzerland and Belgium are great examples of places where this is possible and it's been proven over decades, centuries even. Israel can be a place of peace, but there has to be active work on that side from the Israeli side and the Palestinian side together. And state violence is violence too. The state has to remove its boot from the necks of the Palestinian people, the Arab people as well. All sides must commit to nonviolence. They must commit actively to peace. And then truly, one day, I truly believe there can be peace. So I've come bringing amazing news and actually timely news. Amazon has its first ever union. Boom, firework effects. I actually don't have the ability to do firework effects, but you know, just pretend champagne, firework effects, big explosions, cool stuff. But this is great news. And it's great news because first of all, Amazon is in desperate need of unionization. But two, and more importantly than that, it means Amazon can be beat. And just like we saw with the Starbucks union, we will start to see many more Amazon warehouses start to apply for, for unionization. Now, the Bessemer, Alabama vote, we don't know how that's going. There are three or 400 ballots that are in question. The counting of those ballots is, is ongoing right now. But Staten Island, JFK 8 specifically, that warehouse, is now officially unionized. The Amazon labor union is official. It officially exists. Um, this is a great day for labor, obviously. This is a great day for unions. Unions are now polling at the highest that they've polled in decades. I think the, the national approval in the last poll I saw was like 63%, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it means unions now have majority support in the US, which is amazing. It means that people are going to want to see more unions. They will advocate for unions. They may choose to shop in union spaces. You know, I can't predict how every individual person is going to react to the news about unions, but God, I would feel so much better about shopping on Amazon if it was a union shop. And so I sincerely hope that as we, you know, as the months and years go on, more and more Amazon workspaces get unionized, get better wages, better benefits, are allowed to go home in, in storms. There is so much good that a union can bring to a workforce. And I am so proud of the individuals in the Staten Island JFK 8 warehouse for voting yes, for voting union yes. I'm proud of all the Starbucks, um, uh, all the Starbucks locations. I think there's like 60 of them now that have applied for, uh, for unionization and for the many that are currently casting votes. If you're in a workplace and you can form a union, go ahead and do it. The momentum is there. Finally, there is an opportunity for labor to come out on top and exercise real power against the capitalist class. Look, man, and, and this goes for wherever you work. If Jeff Bezos can be beat, any CEO can be beat. And that is amazing news. It gives the opportunity for us. By the way, you don't have to agree politically with your fellow unionist, right? The thing that you need to agree on with your fellow unionist is that someone 
is screwing you, that you know who that someone is, your boss, and that you want to utilize the power of your collective to fight that power, to fight the power of the boss, right? To get yourself better benefits. Can you imagine, by the way, Amazon, especially because they make so much in profit, can you imagine if that wealth could be redistributed to regular Amazon workers? I know maybe the starting salary could be like 25 or $30 an hour. We rely on these people for so much and, and breaks too. These people need breaks as well. You know, we could fundamentally transform Amazon from the inside and it would just be such a beautiful thing to see. I sincerely hope that this ticks off a wave like it did in Starbucks. I hope that, you know, we never get to a place where, you know, any of these union shops want to renounce their union. But I, I think, you know, we've, I think we've crossed the Rubicon now. I think there are enough major corporations starting to unionize and people see this, right? And shout out to More Perfect Union, shout out to all the other outlets that are covering um, stories about unions because it's time the American people sees that they actually do have some power. Maybe not in Washington, okay? Maybe not in the courts, okay? Maybe not even in their state capitals, but they have power where they work. There is a place where Americans can reclaim the power that's been stolen from them over de decades and decades and decades, and it's in the workplace. If every shop in America was unionized, it would fundamentally change the US economy in a way that might be irreversible. I hear you, shush. Are we done? We might be done. How are we, how are we looking in here? A little golden brown. Right, let's give it five minutes. So I don't have as much time as I would like because my shortbread is probably about five minutes away from being done. But there is one more thing I wanted to talk to you guys about this week that is kind of unique to uh, that is that is kind of happening right now. So the Buffalo Bills the professional football team are looking to get a new stadium. The total cost of the stadium is to be about $1.4 billion. Now you think, okay, well, fine, whatever they can spend what they want on it, right? It's their stadium. Well, so you see, unfortunately, oftentimes these Football teams rely on the cities and the, and the county and the state to purchase these behemoths for them. Now, this is obviously fundamentally unfair, but not just because football teams make tons of money and could easily, if they saved their pennies, afford to build a stadium all by themselves. But the other reason is, is because the cities barely see any of the return on this investment, right? So the, the argument that's sold to cities and, and counties and states and whatever is if you build this stadium for us, we're going to bring all these people here and they'll buy things and they'll do whatever. And then you'll get all this tax money that goes back, right? You know, you get all these taxes and, you know, people buy beer, you'll get beer tax, whatever, you know, you'll get lots of money. It's an investment. It's an investment. It'll actually bring more money into the locale. But truthfully, the amount of money that's brought in by these stadiums is eclipsed by huge margins by the amount they've spent. So, for example, in Buffalo, Buffalo is asking the state of New York, the, uh, the county that Buffalo uh, is, is in, and I'm, I'm blanking on which one it is, so I apologize, all New Yorkers, for forgetting which county Buffalo is in. Um, I don't think it's Monroe. I don't know. I apologize. The, the county and then Buffalo, the city, to pitch in $1.1 billion out of the 1.4 that's necessary. That means a team who can afford to play its, can, who can afford to pay each of its players tens of millions of dollars every year. By the way, that's a bench of like 50, 60 people. So this team is at least bringing in about a billion dollars a year. Okay, at least. That team's only being asked to contribute $300 million. To the whole project it's for them the city 
and the state are going to get almost nothing back comparatively compared to what the bills are going to get back because they will profit off of ticket sales. They'll profit off of the concessions because they'll charge rent to, uh, to the vendors. They will benefit off of any merchandise that's purchased. And of course, ticket sales, right? I may have mentioned that already. Maybe I did. Maybe I did. I don't really remember. But the truth is that property services that team. And the state and the cities, whenever lose all that money. And by the way, even if they did make that money back, because of the way that cities and states work and are funded, and I'll get to that in a different episode. I've been waiting so long to tell you guys how cities and states are, are funded throughout the year. I just haven't had a good time to do it. But because of the way that cities and states are funded, that money has to come directly out of the pockets of something else. So imagine all the things that New York State could do. Let's leave Buffalo and their county out of it for a second. But imagine all the things that, that the state of New York could do for its own citizens with $1.1 billion. That's a lot of stuff. They could build whole affordable rent. They could they, you know, they could finance an affordable rent program. They could build all this. They could build tons of affordable housing. They could revamp their infrastructure. There's a ton of things that a billion dollars buys for a state. And you take all that money out of their treasury and give it to a sports team that makes at least a billion dollars every year. The answer is clear. This is obviously an unfair trade. And the state doesn't know for sure if that money is going to come back to it. The city and, and county don't know for sure if that money is going to come back to it. But we have been allowed to be convinced by these incredibly profitable corporations. And by the way, that's what sports teams are. That if we just give more public money to this private organization, we'll be better off. And there is, there is no argument for why that is true. There is nothing in data that I have seen anywhere that makes that even close to being, oh, it's beautiful. That makes that even close to being true in the slightest. So Buffalo, New York State, whatever county Buffalo is in, please fill, pull out of this deal. Can't afford it. And even if you can afford it, you didn't ask permission of the people who paid that money into you to do this. It is completely unacceptable that this is the direction that the state of New York, the city of Buffalo, and again, whatever county it's in, are going to go with this money. This money can and should be used for bigger, better, and more important things that help more regular people. The economy is rough right now. There is no reason that Buffalo should be spending a billion dollars that it doesn't have on a stadium for a sports team that's already got a good stadium that does plenty for it. It's ridiculous. It doesn't make any sense. And whoever is behind this project either is in it for the bills, is completely idiotic, or got bamboozled. I, I can't think of any other reason why you would have something so craven going on. You heard the timer go. This is our work of art. We are going to want to leave it in here to cool for a little bit. So I'm just going to put this down here, you know, for 10, 15 minutes. Okay. This is where I want it. You guys can cook it for more. You can cook it for less. Actually, we've got a good golden brown color here. So it actually might be a little harder than I want it to be. But this is this is fully cooked. Have it harder than this if you want. Um, but you want to leave it here for 10, 15 minutes, just enough for it to cool a little bit. And then you're going to want to use some kind of tool. This is metal, so you, on metal, so you probably don't want to use that. But, you know, use a plastic spatula. Use something like that to dislodge the signs. Pull it out. Cool it on a rack. Once it has cooled completely, as absolutely room temperature, do not do this while it's warm. You can cut it into squares, diamonds, triangles, whatever you want, okay? But it will be absolutely beautiful, and I can't wait to see what shortbreads you make and how much shortbread you make, because this is one of my favorite recipes ever. By the way, this is also a great base recipe if you want to make something like lemon bars or key lime bars or even cheesecake bars, anything like that that requires a shortbread base. This is the perfect shortbread recipe for that. All right, guys, that is it for this week. 
I will be out next week, as I mentioned. I cannot wait to see you again in two weeks, and we will have so much more to talk about when that comes and a brand new recipe. All right? Take care, everybody. Thanks for watching this video, guys. If you liked it, throw a like on it, share with your friends, and subscribe for more of our content. You can also find all of our videos and clips on YouTube.com. Just search Let Them Eat Bread and you'll find all of our content. All right, guys. See you next time. Bye for now.